It is May from Markets with May, and this is my first live stream. And I'm a little bit nervous. We'll see how it goes. But this was a much requested video. Um, and some of you guys saw me earlier kind of doing a little bit of prep work because I really, really have never done this sort of thing before. Um, but I do want to um, address the reverse split that so many people have asked so many questions about. Um, so we're going to do that today. And I have to give the disclosures. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. This is not investment advice. This is for education purposes only. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an extended shout out to gorilla.app. Money goes where it's treated best. This is kind of a first video so that later when we start doing live streams for Gorilla covering the you know, S&P 500, which I usually cover plus, so to speak, all the other stuff that we do um, and helping them with uh, market strategy information, then we'll know what's up. But if you want to subscribe to my channel, then you can get notifications of that sort of thing. So now I'm just going to go into the seven misunderstandings that I saw. And there was quite a lot, not going to lie. Um, I thought that someone else would basically do the video to end all videos and I wouldn't have to make this video. That's not how it played out. Instead, when I reviewed the questions on my, um, let me stop sharing for a second. Instead, what happened was when I reviewed the questions in my comment section, and I also looked at the videos that others looked at, I saw a mixture of great information, but not necessarily for this particular uh, issue that's going on at AMC. And then some of it was a little bit off in places. And then a lot of it was it was just not packaged together in a way that I think is ultimately going to be helpful for the AMC apes to try to make their decision. And that includes my video, by the way, because in my video, I go through why I like it. But because I had never conceptualized the types of questions that people might have, it's not a complete answer to how you should make your investment decisions or even the things that you might need to ask or hear in other places that could just be outright wrong. So now we're just going to, I'm just going to address all of the questions, seven of them. Let me share my screen now. Um, okay. So this is the outline for what I'm going to go through. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Okay. These are the seven areas that I think people kind of got confused on. There was cost basis versus market value. Ownership was all over the map on this one. New market cap. I saw so many strange things there. And then I think these are kind of the next four are really things that I think people just didn't know that are actually really relevant in this particular case, which is enterprise value versus market valuation, fractional shares on the reverse split, which is actually relevant no matter what, but becomes an even bigger deal because a lot of you have questions specifically about certain dynamics of this stock. And then does the reverse split cause, this is the important part, the shares to go down. And then I'm going to give you some examples. Other people have given examples, but these examples I think are more directly relevant and directly helpful. So let's, let me stop sharing again and let me just go through each one. The first one is cost basis versus market value. Um, okay. I saw so many people ask questions about, and, and the confusion around this about, whether or not you would, um, I'm going to take questions at the end, guys, but keep them coming because uh, I'll just kind of keep an eye on it. But I saw so many questions on people feeling like they were going to lose 90% of their value or something like that on a 10 for one split. And that's just, whoever is doing that has, um, you're very welcome, Bas Batar. Um, I, that's just wrong. I don't know how to say it. And I think what happens is because there's a misunderstanding of market value and um, cost basis. When it comes down to what do you own? Like what is your share ownership? What percentage of the company you own? What is going on there? That's always gonna be the total value of what you own. It will never be anything, you, you should never have to do any additional math. So if you own $100,000, like let's say you're baller, okay, because that's a big position, <laughs> unless you're just super rich. But if you own $100,000 worth of AMC, and let's pretend like, okay, so to make, keep the math simple, that AMC is only a million dollar company, right? Then you own 10% of that company, and it doesn't matter how many shares they either increase, decrease, split, reverse split, whatever, you still own 10%. And that's really, really important because on the reverse split, nothing should share, nothing should change in the percent ownership, and therefore nothing should change 
as relates to what you own. No one took any value away from you because it's always the price of the shares times the it's always the price of the shares um, times the number of shares you own. There's some caveats to that, and we're going to get to that. And this is where I noticed a lot of the videos got very messed up. So realize that no value, no market value was removed from you. And therefore, that also says that when the price goes up 10%, whether it's going from like um, $10 to $11, or whether it's going from um, $100 to $110, it still has to go up 10%. Now, I recognize how frustrating that must be for a lot of people that bought this at like 70 bucks or something much higher. And I know that sucks. And there's not much that I can say to you to make you feel better about it. And plus, I'm not a lying liar. So there would be nothing to say to you. It's going to actually have to increase the same percentage to get back to that as it does now. And the number that you calculate, you'll notice should be exactly the same percentages. Um, we will at the very back end address how some of that, um, how to think about that, um, whether you are like, hold on for dear life till it gets back to that, or whether you have a number in mind where you're willing to take the L on it. Okay. So in both cases, we will address that, but the concept has nothing to do with cost basis on how you should think about that. That's more something else, which we will get to. Sorry, which you guys don't realize I'm editing out all the time in the full and the non-live videos is me drinking because I get really dry when I talk. So that's what's actually happening. Um, I'll put it down to the left here. Um, okay. Now, um, the next thing that I want to mention that is on my little list, hold on, let me share it again, is, um, let's see the slides, is... Um, Mar new market value. Oh, sorry. Percentage ownership. Okay. So we talked about percentage ownership. Um, I'm going to talk about percentage ownership with new market value because here is where a lot of people got very confused. And I think what happened is a lot of people are thinking about percentage ownership only ever taking into consideration their specific share class. And that is um, there are two ways that people make this error. The first way is a pure, they just didn't know the concept. The second way um, it, that is accentuating that is that um, the data feeds read very strangely. So I'm going to show you exactly where to get the information of what your percentage ownership is versus just market value, cost basis, mumbo jumbo. Okay. Because that's the wrong way to think of it. All right. Let me share my screen. And what you need to understand for what, you're, what the confusion lies like where the confusion is and all that stuff is this right here. Okay, when you go to something like a Yahoo Finance, you're gonna get this page right here. It's gonna tell you the market cap is 2.62 billion. But I'm gonna tell you that for sure, that is your um, undiluted market value that doesn't, and it is not a fully diluted market cap. A fully diluted market cap takes all of the shares outstanding including the preferreds. In this case, you'll need to because of the nature of the conversion of the preferreds back into the ordinaries. What the heck does that mean? Okay, let me show you really clearly again. I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, I am still really new to this whole thing. So hopefully you guys can see my screen. Okay. But here on this screen, um, you can see if you scroll down, this is how I know that the number is wrong in Yahoo, right? If you say, if you look at this, it says shares outstanding 513.33 million. And that is the wrong fully, that is a, that is the number of shares of AMC stock, but that is not the fully diluted number of shares outstanding. Okay. For sure. 100%. To get the fully diluted shares outstanding, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Number one, you can just be super clever and just have it memorized because you've watched all the corporate actions. But at this particular point in time, because there's just so much stuff going on in the last two releases that happened, what I would recommend is the closest number you could possibly get would be the last number that came out in the 10K. And what you'll do, I'm going to show it to you to find so you can find it. Um, you go to the, uh, gosh, I'm so new at this guy. Sorry. You go to the SEC filing, right? And that's the SEC filing. And you'll go to this, actually the 10Q. Okay. You go to the 10Q because basically the 10K is the annual report. And that hasn't come out since March the 1st. The last report that came out was um, November the 8th. And it will give you everything usually up until a certain point. Okay. And then when you click on that, you will get, um, let me stop share and get a different tab. 
if you when you click on that um, that link, you will then be able to find it in the actual 10K itself, which I think is yeah this thing. Okay, this thing right here, you'll get the SEC filing, and I literally read the SEC filing for every single talk that I will ever talk about on my channel. Period, because a lot of times the presentation is. Um, accurate because honestly they have to file all, everything they ever put on their website with the SEC. Uh, but it can be a little bit hard to recenter to what management is trying to tell you. So you have to look at the 10 Q for any clarification and the 10 Q will always be right relative to anything that was in the management decks and the such, um, because ultimately one tells you what they filed with the SEC and is legal. The other stuff is also probably correct, but has context and words on top of it that may not then be in the presentation itself. So wonderful thing that you can look at is here. And then you'll see that the, the way that they've structured it is all the consolidated statements are in item one. Okay. And that's common. And it helps you to just click on the hyperlinks and get through it. You will always find the fully diluted share count here at the end of every single income statement, there's like literally no one that does it differently occasionally, but really no. And you'll see that the diluted shares outstanding and the basic shares outstanding is 1 billion shares. Okay. So why is Yahoo Finance getting it wrong? Turns out Yahoo Finance always gets it wrong. Every data vendor gets it wrong. It just is how it is because that number that you're getting is actually the total shares of AMC. There are also, as we all know, at the time of that release, which was dated, um, it was dated and filed um, <clears throat> month end September. So September 30. As of September 30th, there were about a billion shares. And that is coming from the ape shares. And so at all times, it was the case that to correctly, um, um, to correctly um, calculate your percentage ownership, you had to take into consideration the ape shares. Okay. There's another little nuance. So that brings me, so that's just something I wanted you to note um, on percentage ownership. <clears throat> There's never, never, a t if you had held on to your ape shares, you would have always held that ownership stable. Once you sold your ape shares, if you sold it right at the off rating, you immediately um, have your ownership. That's just how dilution, that's, that's what the deal is. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's actually then talk about what the new market value is. And I'm going to share my screen again, because this part is the part that makes it really not straightforward. And I feel a little bit bad about this um, because a lot of this is me learning how to communicate um, to all of you guys, because there's stuff that I just kind of think, you know, I haven't been in the same dialogue with all the people coming at you guys with weird information that's really hard to follow because that's what it looks like to me when I look at the comments. So when I came in, I was not thinking that there was all this background stuff that might be causing you guys a lot of grief. And if you look at my December 6 video, one of the things I kept saying was that the ape shares traded a discount to the AMC shares. And so the ape shares, when you modify for the mar implied market cap are actually really interesting. But I didn't know, I didn't realize that so many of you guys were looking at the non-diluted market cap and thinking that was the market value, number one. And number two, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't really appreciate how much people could get this wrong um, and then write videos on it. So now I'm not actually trying to clarify best I can what the actual market value should be. And then and then we're going to talk about why it's a little bit complex even right now to calculate the market clap, cap correctly. So let me share my screen on that again. Um, gosh, you know, I'm really hopefully you guys can see this clearly. I'll just keep trying to do this best I can because um, I'm really trying to trial the software as well. Okay, if you look on here and you see this market cap, 2.6 billion, um, you'll see that um, if you go to the ape shares, you see a different market value, which is 4.6 billion. And what you're really technically supposed to do is add those two things together, given that for both, um, given that for both, you... Um, Let's see what my screen goes. Yeah, so it's not sharing it. I'm going to have to flip between screens in order to do it. Okay, so 2.6 uh, billion, you guys can see on my screen right now. Now let me share my screen again and quickly show you the market value of um, APE so you can see that, okay? The market value of APE right now is 4.67 billion. Okay, so um, what is the right way to think about the two? 
at this point in time. Um, actually, both are kind of, the weird thing is you have kind of a, so number one, quick question, quick answer to a quick question. What is the actual implied market value of the two together? Typically and traditionally, you'd add the two together. But because there's a couple of facets that you just don't know the answer to, you can't exactly do that. The first thing is that you don't know given uh, the notices that came out at the end of December, precisely how many total shares outstanding there are at this point. Um, and some of, and the reason that that's not as simple as just going through the releases and trying to calculate it out is that you have the ape shares that were issued. Some of them, I, it sounds like to me, and this is really hard to get clarification from, even if you ping the IR desk, some of them, it sounds like to me, were held in treasury meaning they weren't necessarily needing to issue and create new ape, ape units um, to raise capital. Some of them, it sounds like they did actually create new ape units to raise capital. And then in some cases, what happened is that the dilution from the debt, meaning some of the debt was structured as a convert with shares within it that are also shares, um, were retired in order to pay off um, some of the debt and transfer the shares into ape units. So this one, what is the actual market cap right now? I actually think is a big unknown. Um, and, and so that one is a little bit tough. Um, it, but essentially, if you wanted to do a rough estimate, it would be about $6 billion. Okay. Right at this minute, given how the two closed. Um, how to think about that and which shares you want to own as a result is also a little bit of a tough question. And how to think about what that implies when you merge and what the new shares will be worth and how that all allocated it gets allocated out has two complications to it that have nothing to do with which one has the higher market cap. So this is just a real confusion that I think will have to be clarified as soon as we figure out um, what the so. Sorry, I'm kind of confusing this. I'm doing the best I can. I apologize, guys, because this is live. This is what I usually cut out if you're wondering it. What you really need to have happen to get full clarity on this is you need the board to vote that the vote that they do actually want to put it to a shareholder vote. And then in the proxy, there will be clarifications that are given. They can't do that right now because it would be highly unprecedented and potentially um, not legal, for lack of a better way to say it, to release something to a random person that just one off asks the investor relations or and also because the board really does have to discuss what's been proposed to them as it's been proposed and then discuss. So commenting on it before that could get you into trouble with the SEC. So my suspicion is the next real data point to truly understand what exactly is going on there has to be after the board vote, when they release all the information and give it to the shareholders of record to then take a vote on it. Okay, and the other thing that you kind of want to note there and this is part of the reason why I think these videos and other folks making these videos, that's all really important, is that I would personally, to the extent that anyone from MSC sees this, request that they, in the proxy statement, provide ex extreme clarity, put the math there to help us out. Do you know what I mean? On exactly what exactly would be the conversion ratio of APE to AMC. Because I do think that even if you are a brainiac, it would be really, really hard to read the two press releases, understand the debt component and how you precisely transfer that, account for any other dilution that may exist from the various things within your cap structure, and then make a call on what the market value is um, thereafter. So hopefully that... Uh, that's actually part of the reason why it took a while for me to answer some of your questions, but hopefully that clarifies it out and that hopefully clarifies for other people um, some different pieces. But it, I would say that right now using the combination of those two market caps isn't the worst call in the world. However, if you're doing any actual valuation work, you wouldn't use market value anyways. And that's part of the reason I know there was a lot of criticism for my last video on why I was asking specifically for Buffett style investors to look at it. Um, but now I'm going to actually clarify that and also show you a couple of things as to how to think about um, AMC valuation, et cetera. And I think this also will address some of the folks that now have been putting out videos on hostile takeovers and takeout values, which I, I feel like I unwittingly opened a can of worms by answering some questions in my comments. So the thing that you look at 
when you're thinking about hostile takeover, takeover values, et cetera, is not actually, you look at market value for sure. Okay. That is true. Kind of is what it is. Um, but remember, um, when you look at market value, what you really want to look at is who gets what vote for the board seat. And um, if you get what, what someone with a hostile or whatever is going to be looking for, to get the majority vote um, or enough of a vote to vote in whatever people they want and then change the company around. Additionally, the other way to think about it is you want a percentage if you're like a big company and you want to take in the shares so that you can then have them be a subsidiary, um, you would want to get a percentage ownership that would allow you to to follow the U.S. laws as relates to being that type of shareholder. That is a tax question, by the way, which I refuse to answer tax questions because that is not my background, but that's what you would look for. Um, and, and that's kind of a missing piece, but it doesn't necessarily make those videos wrong. So I'm not throwing shade at anyone for making those videos. OK, um, I honestly don't know because I haven't thought through it that way. But the Buffett style uh, shareholders in general will look at the cap structure and see if there's something that can be done there um, to uh, refinance the debt or do what li literally Mr. Aaron just did, which is buy back the debt on the cheap and then just recap the debt. Um, keeping the ca excess capital and then using that as a function to recap. So there's all these like really creative things that a, a Buffett style share uh, uh, analyst would absolutely do that your typical relative value or value investor would not do. But no matter what you did, the one reason why all of this other gobbledygook with respect to the share count won't matter to you is that you're not going to use market value to do your valuation analysis. You're going to use enterprise value. And I do have a video, oddly enough, on this. It's embedded in a video called Enterprise Value to EBITDA versus Price to Earnings. Um, and this would be the case where you'd really have to think about Enterprise Value to EBITDA uh, or just Enterprise Value in general, because there is no EBITDA currently as the company spits, uh, sits because he's still coming into cash flow positive. But let me share my screen again. And um, I'm going to show you where to look for what enterprise value actually is. And um, let's see what you do for enterprise value. And in this number is correct on all of the data feeds. And that is you're going to add back in the debt and the cash. And since there's not a ton of cash, actually, that's not the right debt number. OK, that's not the right debt number. Sorry, guys. So, um, I mean, it depends. Gosh, technically it is the right debt number, but I know what that's including, which you have to think really long and hard about whether you use that number or the number that I'm about to show you. But essentially you'll add back in the cash to debt and then you'll add the two things back to market value, the fully diluted market value. So that's that six billion that I'm telling you. OK. And the reason you do that is when you buy a company, you also own the liabilities. Right. And so that's why when you have anyone that's trying to buy out a company, um, they're going to also and the price that they're willing to pay for it, take into consideration the debt, which means that any buyer has to also do and be pretty smart about the debt workout piece. And um, I'm going to pause right there for a second and also address some of the things that have been coming out that I think are a little bit cray cray, which is, oh, the debt guys just want this thing to go bankrupt and all that other stuff. Um, I don't think there's appreciation by the folks that say that of how painful it is when a company goes bankrupt to be the holder of the debt. Like, it's really fun if the company's already gone bankrupt and you believe that you have the skill set to do a debt workout. But it's really not that fun if the company is still in the process of going bankrupt um, or potentially could go bankrupt, which I think that word is misapplied to AMC, given that they literally still have at a minimum a year of run rate to try to turn this thing around. Um, so so there's that. So anyone that's talking about that, um, I think they might have a little bit of a flawed understanding of how painful it is. And if you would like to observe and make your own decision on this, you can look at the FTX situation that's going on because we know that's already we already know that's fraud. Um, John J. Ray is going in and working that out. That's called a debt workout. And you can see my video on that where I talk about um, Mr. Ray's hearing before the Senate. And he's still one month in trying to figure out how to strategize getting all the debt holders back the things that they own and whether or not that's possible. It is not fun 
to actually allow the company to go in bankruptcy. So I'm just going to say it that way. And not only is it not fun because you're not, you'd have to be damn sure that all the, watch my language. Sorry. That also is what gets cut out when I don't do this live. Um, you'd have to be really sure that all of the assets are greater than the liabilities to push it into bankruptcy. Um, in which case you should have just let it um, make money off those assets. OK, so um, so there's that. And also you have to be willing to wait the entire period that it takes to have it be go through bankruptcy court. And that can be in the short run, maybe three to five years. That would be for a so company this size pretty fast. Or it could be like Lehman Brothers, where the last claim was paid out earlier this year. That happened in 2008. So you do the math. Hence, it is not fun to do uh, to let this thing go into bankruptcy and try to work it out in bankruptcy court. OK, so let me just help you all out with that <laughs> as far as that goes, because that one I just didn't even know how to begin to answer in words on the comments. But I do appreciate you guys sharing with me where the things have gotten really far left. So, um, again, sorry, I am digressing, which is also why I tend not to do live casts that often. But you're going to use enterprise value. Again, um, let me actually show you the debt number that I would typically use and why. I would use, you would go here and then to back to the 10Q. That's what I'm looking at right now. You go to the balance sheet and you'd look at corporate borrowings. Okay. Now, it is technically correct um, to use the operating lease liabilities as well. However, uh, and, and that's what the 10,000 number is. It's the addition of the corporate borrowings and the operating lease liabilities. Um, uh, the reason I don't know that that's the right way to do it is because a lot of those operating lease liabilities, given the nature of what this business is, which is it's just movie theaters, those are that's really, I think, rental expense. And so if you went bankrupt, that part is a little bit less of a big deal as far as like you would literally just pay whatever release um, it was to get you out of the lease. Because I'm sure, uh, Mr. Aaron, it's, I think it's one of the first things he did was renegotiate all these leases. And I'm sure that um, the even the even the um, tent landlord probably didn't want to lock him in because and if the landlord did correct me if I'm wrong, but it would have been really awkward because it would also tie you up as the landlord for um, some period of time, which may not be fun for you. So that's um, one way to think about enterprise value and take out and all that stuff. That's what you have to take in. So I would be more oriented towards um, ignoring the operating leases, which I know some fun fundamental people will kill me for that, but um, or thinking about them a particular way, let's say it that way, than using the entirety of enterprise value to calculate what you're actually buying. OK, um, the next thing that is a little bit awkward is. Let me go back to my little outline. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we're through the first three fractional shares on the split. Okay. I mentioned this so fast on the initial video I did for why I'm voting yes. And I realized that that probably was too fast given all the other stuff that was going on with this um, company. But what happens when you do a reverse split is that the exchange, so this is where the exchange comes into play. The exchange has to do a recalculation on all of the shares. In this case, you think the math is really simple because it's just 10 for one. So if you had 100 shares, now you have 10 shares. The problem is not everybody owns round lots of shares. Some people might own like, um, you know, something that doesn't divide evenly. And what happens then is that from the common stock, pers stock perspective, you'll end up with fractional shares. So let's say you owned 101 shares, then you'll see 10.01 on the day that it opens. So I really do mean it when I say either buy up to something that rounds out cleanly to um, a, a hundred shares or 10 shares or round down to it and sell that little stub that you have. That's on the common stock market. The options market has to do the same thing, but now it has to be round lots of 10 contracts, 10 contracts, a thousand shares. If you fail to round up your contracts to 10 contract lots, when you go to try to sell them the next day, you are really up a creek. I mean, it is so hard to sell fractional shares. I've gotten caught with this once or twice when I was long it and I couldn't get out of the contract either way. I just had to pray that it actually worked in my direction. So the puts, folks that have puts on this really need to be very careful. For the record, folks that have calls on it also have to be very careful. But that's what I meant by fractional shares 
Subsequent to that, I feel like people have gone all over the map with that, but that's the math that you just have to be very careful of. And so if you've got mostly puts on this, then you just have to watch out for whatever trading dynamic associated with that. Now, I think that any big house, um, knock on wood, um, as soon as they see it put to shareholder vote, will probably just for the sake of risk, uh, round out their shares, for lack of a better way to call it. But it's always hard to say. Um, and they would probably round it out over the period of time until the share vote happens. And um, they will, you know, and then really you just got to be ready for whatever kind of administrative stuff has to happen. That's what that meant. All right. Now let me share my screen and continue through this. I can't believe you guys are watching this. I'm so thankful that you guys are supporting me in this. Um, all right. Let me share it back here. Does the reverse split cause the shares to go down? Oh my gosh, there are so many videos on this. And I know that this is the major question that everyone was asking anyways. And the answer is causality is not the same as what's actually forcing the stock to go down. Um, there are a couple of people that did great videos on this already and showed stocks that do go up, but I want to make it really clear. <laughs> what causes the stock to go down is people shorting it and people will short it if they think it's going bankrupt or they think it's overvalued. Those are the only two things. So ultimately what AMC really will have to do, and we've got one quarter, plus we've got the annual meeting um, that will happen probably before then the shareholder vote gets passed through, but we'll need to see some execution. Look, as much as I do own my Ape shares and I am therefore aligned with every single uh, bullish person by, by, by virtue of ownership. Okay. I am aligned with you guys. Um, the, um, the, the reality is even I need to see them execute. Okay. <laughs> Let me say it that way. And you guys should too. You should not um, feel like being um, loyal to AMC doesn't mean that you want them to execute on the things that they've said, right? That's, that's what shareholders are supposed to do. We want the company to make money. So um, that is the main reason why stock will go down at all times. The reverse split in and of itself will only uh, cause a problem if um, the folks believe that it's going to continue to do this downward spiral of poor management. So you have to make a call on whether or not you think that the objectives that are underway will help the company make money. I happen to think they do. There's other people that happen to think they don't. But a technical reason is not a good reason um, to say that the company is not going to make money. OK, that that's just that that's not a good reason. Like it needs to be like the stuff that people put out on watching how many films come out and how profitable they are. It needs to be the type of research that people are seeing at the two objectives they've made, which is an, a desire to um, um, monetize the brand through consumer products or alternatively the high craft mining stuff that, but I want to show you very clearly two companies that received funding or started to show a turn that started to move up. So you can clearly get examples of when this is the case. And I will also mention that most of the examples that are given are quantitative in nature. They're just showing a bunch of companies that also traded down. But so many of those companies were penny stocks that had no hope ever of getting financing. And what they were trying to do was buy more time to be to stay listed so they could potentially pursue financing. That's not the case with AMC, which is what the two releases on the 19th and 22nd were all about. And then we'll have to see whether or not he executes on the quarter. But let me show you specifically the two examples that can help you out a little bit. And because um, one of them actually, for whatever reason, they just happen to be two things that I follow. And I, so I'll give you the one that's the most easy. Um, it's, it's GE, GE in um, a turnaround for some time. And um, GE uh, did their reverse split in, August 2nd, do, 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 somewhere around here. And you can see it popped up, then it went straight down. Okay. And the reason it went straight down was because um, people love to trade a, uh, GE uh, because GE has, like AMC, a lot of debt. And it's actually um, the opposite of a turnaround. It's more of a, it, well, is it a turnaround? It's, it's a turnaround, fair and square. But what it actually has to do as its strategy is continue to sell off businesses um, because it was at one point a, um, a, a gigantic roll up strategy. I won't go to you. But OK, so it has to continue to sell off businesses and then it has to figure out how to finance itself. And so people um, down here. 
Ooh, sorry, guys. Um, people down here in the trough weren't sure whether it could finance itself. And then uh, GE reported its quarter and finally started to show some good numbers. Sorry, let me share my screen. This is really not easy for me. Sorry, guys. I appreciate you working with the snafus of my first time going live. Um, okay, so what had to happen here was they had to report the quarter. And as soon as they reported the quarter and started to show finally for the first time in a really long time, to be fair, um, some, some positivity, you start to see the stock go up. And this latest move really is because I think folks were worried about whether or not the um, – whether or not the um, the trillion dollars in um, spend that has already been agreed to as a part of COVID for infrastructure was going to take them higher. So that's GE example one. Example, so that's a large cap and may or may not be relevant to um, the way that you're thinking about AMC. And it surely did trade down before it traded up. I'm going to get to why there's a couple of nuances in AMC, but I want to show you one other that is more in this micro cap land. It's one I follow occasionally, but I don't necessarily do a lot of work on it. Um, okay. This is hall of fame resorts and entertainment. Basically hall of fame owns the hall of fame and they're responsible for monetizing the brand, the hall of fame and all of the uh, media assets that are associated with it for all the hall of famers. For you football fans, as I prove time and time again, I know nothing about sports, so I won't try to further embarrass myself. But Hall of Fame did a reverse split on December the 23rd. Um, this is the chart one year out, but let me just show you the last three months so we can show it. On December 23rd, they did their reverse split and it stock tanked. And then um, shortly after, they announced funding that they were going to get. And that took this. Oh, gosh, I keep doing this. Sorry, guys. Um, shortly after uh, they announced the reverse split, um, I think it was maybe a week ago or so, um, probably on the at the very beginning of the year because the thing started to trade up, they announced that they got funding and the stock jetted back up to a much higher level. So hopefully that demonstrates clearly that the point will never be the stock is just reverse split, therefore it must necessarily trade down. It will always be relative to whether or not the company is doing well and whether or not it gets funding and that what then subsequently should be the valuation associated with that funding. Now let's talk about AMC and why AMC is going to be the most interesting case study. I know I have a lot of haters when I say that, but one of the most interesting case studies for this particular reverse split dynamic. You will 100%, I am sure, have all of those technical momentum people in the stock as soon as this thing splits. You will also have a bit, a, probably a more robust understanding of what exactly happened as relates to financing and what ultimately that implies is the valuation on an enterprise value basis. And remember, because this is a turnaround, the people that care about enterprise value are going to be anyone on the debt side, anyone that's a fundamental shareholder, and then the actual people themselves that are shareholders will care. Um, so we have a couple of missing elements that really await the quarter, but also await what ultimately happens in order to do those calculations. OK, like I can't do them. Maybe some other people have some guesses because they actually are better at the cap structure. But I'll give it to them. I'll just give it to them at that point. <laughs> do you know what I mean, I have to be the brain of all things. <clears throat> but essentially, once you have all that information, then you'll be able to really get a, a true sense for what you think the company will be valued at and what its worth is. Um, but if at between then and now, he additionally answers any more funding, any more um, additional nuances to the cap structure that could improve that improve the circumstances rather than hurt the circumstances of AMC, um, that's um, that would actually pop the stock, not the other way around, for lack of a better way to describe it. So I think that is how I was thinking about it. I know that that is, I know now that that was massively unclear in that video I created. So I apologize for all the confusion it might have caused. And um, like, and the last thing I'll say again, as I really did mean it, past performance is not, I'm not telling you to do what I'm doing. Okay, let me just keep it simple versus reading the disclosure. I'm not telling you to do what I'm doing. Everyone got in at a different cost basis and everybody has a different investment objective and you gotta be true to that. Um, this is the reasons that I made my investment decision on it. And also I've kind of sized it appropriately for that thought process. So it's not, it's not in any way the biggest holding that I have. And it 
um, would not be because I have my own objectives, <clears throat> which is that for stocks that are this volatile, I keep them a certain size at all times. Okay. I don't know if there's one or two questions. I want to, I don't know that I can actually answer. Um, the fraud players, there are a lot of fraudulent players. That's true. Why is my focus on, okay, so I'll go ahead and let me try this feature. Ah, okay. Why is, oh, sorry. Let me show that. Okay. Why is your focus on, on ape shares? Um, well, the stuff that I'm seeing <clears throat> is for all the shares, period. Okay. Um, I own the ape shares and I'm not trying to take a bigger position because my position is what I personally would max out for a bullish call on ape or AMC given um, where the chips currently lie. Um, because the shareholders, because when I originally did the valuation work, um, it looked like ape trading at one seventh the price of AMC, ape was undervalued. So it would have been the right way to invest in it. Later, when I was first doing the work on the conversion ratio, I thought, hey, wait a second, this is still really awkward for what it would mean on a reverse merge because you're still giving this really bizarre discount if the conversion ratio is a couple of different things, okay? Now, um, because we don't actually know those things, I'm just not gonna sell the ape shares on principle, okay? So that's really what it is. I'm not necessarily gonna buy AMC shares on the other side of it because um, I need number one, I still, I need that data too. I need the same data to make the assessment on both sides. Um, and also, um, it's unclear, like, it's unclear to me that there's not still a spread between the two. What I think really needs to happen is the company needs to put out some clarity and it will always be the case that as long as a spread exists between APE and AMC, that all that happens to the AMC shareholders is pressure on the stock. So, while there's a lot of people that want to pit the ape shareholders against the amc shareholders the truth is that as long as you spread those two apart whether the vote goes through or not amc is going to experience pressure because the conversion exists and it's not people that are doing that type of the type of um uh, style of investment that ends up having people go long ape short AMC, amc and then do the exact reverse whenever that comes out of play is called it's it's a it's arbitrage, and the arbitrageurs have their way of doing the calculation. So it's possible that those folks actually do have a better grasp of how exactly the conversion mechanism is going to work. Um, that said, if they have that grasp, they probably are also like me, waiting for the final verdict from management because there is a Chinese wall and they should not be able to do that calculation other than by hiring a bunch of bankers to give their best consulting guess as to what that conversion is. They would not be allowed to ask AMC on the private because that would be a violation of SEC, okay? So everything has to be released to everyone at the same time. The chips are exactly where they are at this point. So um, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. All right, that I think, I don't see any other questions, but I hope that made sense to everyone. Uh, Model 3 dude, I don't know if you're still there. Um, Okay. Any other questions before I peace out? All right. Cool. Good luck. Thanks for being a part of my first live stream. And hopefully um, I will start live streaming on Tuesday with Gurula. What we typically cover is different market news. That live stream will focus on the banks. I have listened to all of the banks that have reported thus far, which is, um, you know, federal uh, FRC, um, Bank of America, City, um, BlackRock, which is not a bank, it's an asset manager, um, JP Morgan, there may be one missing in there. But essentially, I usually give some initial comments on how to think about the banks as relates to macroeconomic stuff, because they surely do give it in all of that stuff. And if you want to hear about that, definitely come in. Um, and then we are still trying to figure out how to do different features. So we may take questions at the end. David always asks questions. You can look at my older stuff to see how we used to run it on Zoom, but we're going to move it to YouTube livecast. Have an awesome 